Okay, let's talk about the idea of expectation, which we'll also call expected values or average and many other terms. So uh, let's start with a little example that should be familiar to you. So let's say we uh, administer a quiz and the scores are 9, 10, 9, 6, and 7. What is the average score of this quiz? Well, the thing we're going to do is just add up these five scores and divide by the total number of scores, which is five. So I'm going to first multiply by a fifth, add up these five scores, and I'm going to get 41 over 5, which is 8.2. Okay, and what we want to do is develop a probabilistic notion of averaging. All right, so it's a very useful thing to do, and we just want to know how do we translate this idea of an average into our probability framework. The expected value, e of x, so we have this e with a double line through it, that's our notation for expected value. This is going to be our notion of an average, um, which we'll also sometimes call the expectation. So the expected value, e of x, of a discrete random variable um, x, that is defined to just be the following. It's the sum over the range of the values x weighted by the probability mass function p of x. Okay, so all I'm doing is instead of just adding up the values and dividing by the total number of values, I'm also weighting them by their probabilities. That's the idea of taking an average in our probability framework. Different values may have different probabilities and we need to account for that. Other terminology that you'll often hear me use and others use is average or mean, and sometimes the notation mu sub x, where x will be the um, letter representing a random variable. Okay, and just a little bit of physical intuition. So you could think about um, the probability or the PMF value at x. So let's say you look at a value x, that could be the mass, all right, of that point. And the expected value is the center of mass of the entire object. Okay, so I have an object, and for whatever reason, it just has these discrete point masses and their masses are given by their probability values. And if I take all of that together and get the center of mass, that is going to be the average. Okay, so let's do an example. We're going back to this experiment that we had in a previous video where we were rolling two four-sided dice and all outcomes were equally likely. We computed the PMF for the sum of the rolls. And you can see that two was the um, first value we could get going all the way up to eight. We had this symmetric looking PMF centered at five. So the expected value of this x is going to be the sum over the range x times the PMF. And so we're going to have two times one over 16 plus three times an eighth plus four times three sixteenths plus five times a fourth plus six times three sixteenths plus seven times an eighth plus eight times one sixteenth. So I just read that off the table or I looked at the um, plot. So either one is fine. And I add up all these values, I get 2 plus 6 plus 12 plus 20 plus 18 plus 14 plus 8 all over 16. So all over a common denominator, and that's going to be 80 over 16, which is really just 5. And this is great because this corresponds to the center of mass that I see on my plot. Okay, so I can see that this nice symmetric PMF is centered at 5, and so I expect that the center of mass I mean, five, and really this is kind of the idea of expectation. It's like, what is the average value I expect to see? That's expectation. So that's the center of mass of the plot, and our calculation got the same value. So that's a nice way of seeing that. Let's do a less symmetric example, okay? So I'm gonna draw for you a PMF. Um, it's not going to be symmetric, and it's gonna have some negative values as well. So it's going to start at negative one, and I'm going to have uh, probabilities ranging from 1 sixth to 1 half. And I'm also going to have this 1 third at negative 1. Okay, so my range is just minus 1, 0, and plus 2 because I don't have any probability at plus 1. And so now I'm going to calculate the expected value. So the expected value is going to be, again, the sum over the values in the range weighted by their PMF values. Okay, well, we'll start with minus 1 times its PMF value, plus 0 times its PMF value, plus 2 times its PMF value, and that's, that's going to be minus 1 times a third, plus 0 times a sixth, plus
plus two times a half, and this is just going to be two thirds. And the main thing I want you to take away from this simple example is that the expected value does not need to belong to the range. Okay, so the range here was minus one, zero, and plus two, and those um, values are fine, so that's what you can actually see when you run an experiment, but the average of those in the long run is going to be something like two thirds. All right. Okay, so now let's talk about functions of a discrete random variable. So often we're not just interested in the random variable itself, we might have some function like the square of the random variable that we care about. Okay, and the key thing to remember here is that when you take a function of a random variable, you're just getting another random variable. Why is that true? Well, a random variable formally is a mapping from the sample space, and each outcome in the sample space was denoted as this little omega. So it's a mapping y from the sample space onto the real number. So that's what this y represents. And the way that we're thinking about this y is it's a function of another random variable. So it's really a function of another mapping from omega. And so what we're doing is we're mapping first with x to the real line, and then with g again from the real line to the real line. And so overall, that's an n to m mapping from the sample space to the real line, which is a random variable. So if you don't really want to follow that uh, level of detail, you can just remember that functions of random variables are random variables. Okay, and how do you get the range and the PMF of these functions? Well, all you need to do is look at the original range, r of x, and original PMF, p of x, of x, and look at the function g of x. Okay, so the range, all I'm going to do is just look at the g of x values that I can get when I start with x in its range. For the PMF, what I need to do is remember the PMF is the probability of all of the outcomes in the sample space for which the mapping sends those outcomes to the value little y. And I'm just going to replace this mapping with the mapping g of x, the composition of those two functions. So I have g x of omega. And so this is formally what I expect to see for the PMF. But in practice, all this means is just add up the values where um, y is what I'm looking for, and I find all of the values x such that g of x maps to that y, and I add up their PMF values. So this notation that I have here, this sum over x such that g of x is equal to y, means sum over x in the range such that g of x for that particular x is equal to y. So find all the x's for which this is true. It's going to be a lot easier to understand this via an example, and that's what we're going to do now. Okay, as an example, let's draw a PMF and let's figure out what happens when we take a function of this, the resulting random variable. So um, I'm drawing my PMF for x, all right, and it's going to have values um, from minus 2 to plus 2. So 2 tenths, 1 tenth, 4 tenths, 2 tenths, and then plus, uh, 1 tenth at plus 2. Okay, and I'll write it as a case by case formula just to be. Um, uh, complete here. So I have 4 tenths, 2 tenths at minus 2 and plus 1, and 1 tenth at minus 1 and plus 2. Okay, and so the range, as I said, is minus 2, minus 1, 0, plus 1, and plus 2. And let's let y equal x squared. So this is the function I'm interested in. I have a random variable, I have a full description of its PMF, but now I'm interested in what happens to the square. Well, first let's figure out what happens to the range. The range our formula tells us is that I look at the um, x squared values such that x is in the range that it used to be in. So I get 0, plus 1, and plus 4. So 0 makes sense. 0 squared is 0. Plus 1 makes sense because minus 1 squared is plus 1, and plus 1 squared is plus 1. And 4 makes sense because that's minus 2 squared or plus 2 squared. So the values on the negative side get mapped over to the positive side because of the square. Okay, what about the PMF? So I'm going to draw this um, plot here. We get ready uh, to work out the PMF. So we have a formula for the PMF, and we're going to just kind of follow that formula case by case. And as you get used to it, you can do this more rapidly. All right, but we're going to do this very carefully for now. So I'm going to have p of y of little y is the sum of x such that x squared is equal to that y, and I add up those PMF values. Okay, so. First, I start at the value 0 in the range of y. So I'm interested in the PMF at 0. 
And so I look for the x's such that x squared is equal to zero, and I add up their PMF values. That's only zero. So I add up the PMF to zero, and that's four tenths. And so what that means on this plot is I'm translating the value of this zero um, down to the y PMF plot. Okay, so I just move the four tenths from P of x down to the uh, four tenths for P of y. Okay, what about P of y at plus one? Well, I'm looking at the values of x such that x squared is equal to plus one, and I add up their PMF values. So that's going to be negative one and plus one. So I add up both of those PMF values. That's going to be a tenth plus two tenths. And so what that looks like from the plot is that I'm adding up the values from minus one and plus one to get three tenths. And then I'm going to see the same kind of thing for plus four. I'm looking for the x where x squared is equal to plus four. And that's going to be the PMF at minus two plus the PMF at plus two for x. And so I'm going to get two tenths plus one tenth Again, 3 tenths, and that makes sense because by normalization we need to add up to 1. That's like taking these two values and adding them up. I'm just going to put some zeros there. Finally, I can work out the expectation of y, or the expected value of y, and I just do that using the PMF that I've just found. So I add up the uh, values of y in its range weighted by its PMF. So I get 0 times 4 tenths plus 1 times 3 tenths and plus 4 times 3 tenths. Okay, and that's going to work out to be 15 tenths, just three halves. Okay, so now we've seen an example of how these functions of random variables work. And what's interesting about this is that often we're not interested in working out the full PMF. We might only be interested in the expected value of a function, right? And we might not care what the PMF is or the range. And so when that happens, it's really convenient to just directly calculate that expected value using the PMF of x and the function uh, y equals g of x. So I want to skip calculating the PMF of y and the range of y because that's tedious. If I can just directly use a formula to get the expected value of y using what I already know about x, that is much more convenient. Let's see how that's going to work. So I want the expected value of y. I know the formula for that. And what I'm going to do is substitute in here for the PMF of y the formula I have for deriving that PMF from the PMF of x. And I'm going to notice here that I actually can put in this value of y into the inner summation because I know in the inner summation the value of y has to be g of x, right? The inner summation is fixing y to be equal to g of x. So I pull it in and I just say that now it's g of x. And that's basically my formula. What I'm doing is I'm just adding up the values of x and, um, sorry, the values of g of x weighted by the probability mass function of x. So if I'm interested in figuring out the expected value of a function, then all I do is add up the values of that function weighted by the PMF values. Okay, let's go back to our previous example and see how that could have simplified things for us. So I had my PMF, I'm interested in x squared, and I'm going to calculate um, the expectation of this y. Okay, so what this formula tells me now is instead of summing up over y, I'm going to sum up over x. And what I'm going to do is instead of putting x times the PMF of uh, x, I'm putting x squared times the PMF of x because I'm interested in the expected value of x squared. Okay, so that's going to work out to be minus 2 squared times 2 tenths plus minus 1 squared times 1 tenth, plus 0 times 4 tenths, or 0 squared times 4 tenths, plus plus 1 squared times 2 tenths, plus plus 2 squared times 1 tenth. That all works out to be 8 plus 1 plus 0 plus 2 plus 4 over 10, which is 15 over 10, which is 3 halves. And it's exactly the same thing I got before. So that's great. And um, even though this was a slightly more involved calculation than the final calculation we had for the expected value of y, it was easier than the whole process of working out the PMF of y and then the expected value of y from that PMF. So that's really convenient. Okay, and finally, another important property of expectation that we're going to see again and again is linearity. All right, And so what that means is that for any random variable x and any real numbers a and b, if I want the expected value of this function ax plus b, I can just pull a and b 
out of that expectation because they're just constants, okay? Let's figure out why. Well, when I look at that expected value, I can use this formula that I just derived, which is that I can put in the function ax plus b weighted by the PMF to work out what that expectation is. And now I'm just going to break the summation into two parts. So I'm going to have an a part, which is um, and a b part. And you'll notice that this uh, a part is actually times the original expectation. And the b part, by normalization, is just b times 1. So what I'm doing on the first term is I have a times the expected value of x. And on the second term, I have b times the sum of all the PMF values, which is just 1. So the formula makes sense. Going back to the previous example, let's use this formula to simplify some calculations. So I'm interested in figuring out z, which is minus 1 half times y plus 3. And I only care about the expected value of z. So remember, we've already worked out that the expected value of y here is 3 halves. So the expected value of z is going to be minus 1 half times that expected value of y plus 3, which is equal to minus 1 half times 3 halves plus 3, which is minus 3 fourths plus 3, which is just 9 fourths. So that was a lot easier than having to now work out what's the new PMF of z and then getting the expected value from there.